Lord be with you. And also Good morning. I greet you in the name of our Savior Jesus on this beautiful day that God has given to us that we can be here in his house, gathered in his name, around word and sacrament, ready to receive his Easter blessings. So, if you would kindly turn, I think today the color is salmon. I thought it was pink, but I was told this morning it's salmon. Uh, just a few things I want to mention here this morning. First of all, uh, uh, Epiphany is ending. We're about to launch into Lent. So Ash Wednesday will be one week from Wednesday. If you are uh, observant of such things, normally Ash Wednesday is in February. This year it's in March because Easter is a skosh late this year. So uh, on March 2nd, we'll be meeting here at 7 p.m. We will have communion. We will have the imposition of ashes for those that want to do that. Uh, we will probably be doing the uh, individual uh, absolution, uh, assuming COVID numbers stay suppressed. Um, and uh, so we've got that coming up a week from Wednesday. Uh, we are going to have midweek meals, but not Ash Wednesday, because that is a day of fasting. Um, but uh, the following Wednesday, uh, I am right about the shield that the kids will be making meals and we're collecting m money for them to go to Houston, right? Okay, uh, and um, normally we take the, the Lenten midweek offerings and give that to something. It's often been places like Ruth or Homa. Uh, at some point, somewhere we discussed that money going to the youth gathering. Anybody have any objection to that? To, to go to the kids at the youth gathering? So, okay, uh, that's probably what we'll do for then with that. Uh, the altar flower chart is up, so if you would like to donate flowers like this uh, uh, arrangement here for Sunday mornings, you can sign up for that. Uh, and then two other things here real quickly. Um, uh, gentlemen, I need you to mark on your calendars March 18th. That is a Friday. It is the first uh, Friday of the NCAA men's basketball tournament and we will be meeting at my house that evening uh, at about six o'clock and I will provide the brisket and the sausage and you guys bring whatever you want to eat or drink with that. Um, this has been a men's fellowship thing we've been doing since 2004. Uh, we've been interrupted now for two years because of COVID but I think the numbers are low enough now if they stay that low we will be doing that Friday March 18th six o'clock at the earlier residence. And then just real quick, if you happen to have a little time this week and want to offer up in prayer, I am scheduled to run a ma half marathon in Stillwater on Saturday at 7.30. Your prayers are offered that, you know, I don't have a heart attack or something, I don't break my knee, uh, and that I'm able to be here next Sunday telling you I'm great, because usually the, it's the second day after a race that I feel like I've been, you know, run over by a car. So. Um, I'll be doing that this Saturday, and uh, your prayers for me are, are welcome in that regard. So, birthdays today, or this week. Elijah McDermott has a birthday uh, today. And um, um, somebody just had a birthday in your row, right? <laughs> happy birthday. Was the 17th? Yep, okay, happy birthday. Glad we could uh, see you here today. And um, uh, let's see here, then uh, Leanne Toll has a birthday tomorrow. So Leanne, if you're watching online, uh, happy birthday and hope you're feeling better. Uh, Gene Abrahamson has a birthday uh, on uh, Wednesday and uh, Bob March on Friday. So if you see those folks, uh, wish them God's blessings. Okay, anything I'm forgetting or neglecting? All right. Let's then go to song number one here this morning, which is Your Name, and God bless our worship together here this morning.
congregation will please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, o Lord, but with you there is forgiveness. O Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess to you all my sins and iniquities with which I have ever offended you and justly deserve your punishment now and forever. But I am heartily sorry for them and sincerely repent of them. And I pray you of your boundless mercy and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor sinful being. Upon this, your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto all of you. And in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all of your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You may be seated for our next song. Streams of 
continue with the readings. The Old Testament reading for today is from Genesis chapter 45. <clears throat> Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him, for they were dismayed at his presence. So Joseph said to his brothers, Come near to me, please. And they came near. And he said, I'm your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves, because you sold me here, for God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there are yet five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. And God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth, and to keep alive for you many survivors. So it is not you who sent me here, but God. He's made me a father to Pharaoh, and lord of all his house, and ruler over all the land of Egypt. Hurry and go up to my father and say to him, Thus says your son Joseph, God has made me lord of all Egypt. Come down to me, do not tarry. You shall dwell in the land of Goshen, and you shall be near me, and you and your children and your children's children, and your flocks, your herds, and all that you have. There I will provide for you, for there are yet five years of famine to come, so that you and your household and all that you have do not come to poverty. And now your eyes see and the eyes of my brother Benjamin see that it is my mouth that speaks to you. You must tell my father of all my honor in Egypt and of all that you have seen. Hurry and bring my father down here. Then he fell upon his brother Benjamin's neck and wept. And Benjamin wept upon his neck. And he kissed all his brothers and wept upon them. After that, his brothers talked with him. This is the word of the Lord. For great is his steadfast love toward us. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. The epistle reading for today is, for, uh, is in 1 Corinthians, chapter 15. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. As, for as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive, but each in his own order. Christ the firstfruits, then at his coming those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end. When he delivers the kingdom of God, the, the Father, after destroying every rule and every authority and power, for he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. Why am I in danger every hour, I protest, my brothers? By my pride in you, which I have in Christ our Lord, I die every day. What do I gain if, humanly speaking, I fought with beasts at Ephesus? If the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. Wake up from your drunken stupor, as is right, and do not go on sinning. For some have no knowledge of God. I say this to your shame. But someone will ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body do they come? You foolish person, what you sow does not come to life unless it dies, and what you sow is not the body that is to be, but a bare kernel, perhaps of wheat, or of some other grain. But God gives it a body as he has chosen, and to each kind of seed its own body. For not all flesh is the same, but there is one kind of humans, another for animals, another for birds, and another for fish. There are heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, but the glory of the heavenly 
is of one kind, and the glory of the earthly is of another. There is one glory of the sun, and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars. For stars differ from star in glory. So is it with res resurrection of the dead, what is sown is perishable, what is raised is imperishable. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We now stand for the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the sixth chapter. Glory to you, Lord. Jesus said, But I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you. To one who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from one who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Give to everyone who begs from you, and from one who takes away your goods, do not demand them back. And as you wish that others would do to you, do so to them. If you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? For even the sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to get back the same amount. But love your enemies, and do good, and lend, expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High, for he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Be merciful, even as your Father is merciful. Judge not, and you will not be judged. Condemn not, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise we now confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. You may be seated for our song of the month. Thank you. 
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The text for your sermon this morning, the biblical basis for our thoughts together here today are the words of the first reading, which Russell shared with us a few moments ago. Genesis chapter 45, selected verses. I believe it's going to be fairly obvious to you here this morning that one of the things that happens to us in our lives is that things go wrong between us and the other people we know. And usually in there somewhere is someone is hurt and usually somewhere in there someone needs to apologize. And so sometimes forgiving somebody is, is pretty easy. Okay? For example, I have forgiven my wife Erica for asking me three Christmases ago to bring kittens into our home and for doing it again this past October. Okay? I make no apologies. <laughs> Now, I don't forgive the kittens for tearing up the furniture. That's a different story, but anyway. I have forgiven my son Christopher for the 1,956 times he has hidden the living room TV remote on me after he turned on the Weather Channel first thing in the morning. And I have forgiven the city of Edmond roadworking crews because, you know, we live on the southwest side of town, so we go to Crest for our groceries, and so I've forgiven the city of Edmond for tearing up 15th and Santa Fe and putting it all back together, and then tearing it up again, and putting it all back together, and tearing it up again, and putting it back together. And the state of Oklahoma seems to be doing that with Broadway and 44, but that's another story. So those are pretty easy things to forgive, but sometimes when somebody has done something to us that, that really hurts, forgiveness is, is harder to come by. So today in our weekly reminder of what God has done to bring us forgiveness, we will also be reminded here today of our need to forgive one another. And that is what we'll be talking about this morning. Now, I don't know if you've thought about this, but forgiveness is essential in our relationships. We can't have relationships without forgiveness. You know, we talk about love being the glue that holds us together. We've been talking about you know, love last week and, and a couple other sermons here recently, you know, because last week, you know, was St. Valentine's Day, and so people were talking about love, and we were talking about uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, you know, love is patient, love is kind, all that stuff. Love is the glue that holds us together, but you can't have love if you don't have the ability to forgive, because without forgiveness, the wounds we both give and the wounds that we receive would drive us apart, Right? Thank you for agreeing with me, Trey. So one example of this I can give to you is a guy named Joseph. And Joseph is going to feature prominently, by the way, in our midweek Lenten services. He's going to be uh, one of the focuses that we have, or foci, if you will, of our Lenten services on Wednesdays. But you may recall that in the book of Genesis that, that Joseph was one of 12 children of, of Jacob. And if you don't remember all this stuff, I'll review for you here. Jacob had 12 kids by four wives. His favorite wife was Rachel. And she was the last of his four wives to, to give birth to a child. He had 12 kids. Joseph was number 11. And Joseph was Jacob's favorite. And for those of you who are parents out there, I know you're thinking, well, surely he didn't make it obvious that this son Joseph was his favorite, he made it very obvious that this son Joseph was his favorite. And there are families where this kind of discussion takes place where one sibling will look at another and say, you know, mom always liked you best. And that is usually said in a, a joking sense or a, a kidding sense. But when I tell you that Joseph was the favorite of Jacob, he was the favorite. And one of the ways in which he showed this and demonstrated this was that he presented Joseph with a coat of many colors. And there's other people that translate that as a, a coat with long sleeves or a, a full-length coat. There are even some who would call it a technicolor dream coat. And I look at Sheila because she's told me that she's fond of that show. But something that I read in my research this week, and I hadn't run across this before, is that J in Jacob giving him that jacket, that coat, he may have been telling Joseph that he was going to receive the birthright. And if you don't know how estates were split in Old Testament days, if you, know, you had more than, than 
you know, two kids, the oldest would get 50% of the, of the estate, and the other, however many there were, would split the remainder. So if you've got 12 sons like Jacob does, you know, and, and one is going to get 50%, the others are going to, the other 11 are going to split up, you know, their, their shares are going to be much smaller. So it's possible that in giving him this jacket, he was telling Joseph, you're going to get 50%. And the oldest son, which I believe was Reuben, may have been going, hey, I'm the oldest, I'm supposed to be getting this. You know? So it was obvious to his 11 siblings that Joseph was the favorite. And so that gift triggered the jealousy of his 11 siblings. And there was also the problem that Joseph had these dreams that demonstrated to him that when he got older, his brothers were going to bow and kneel to him and that he was going to be a lord over them. And if you're an older child, if you have younger siblings, you don't want to be thinking in terms of your baby brother or sister uh, being your boss. That doesn't usually you know, work out very well. Now, if you don't know, uh, and you know, we, we have some you know, newer folks here, I, am, I, I was the youngest of, of four. I, I had three older brothers. My oldest brother died over 15 years ago. But when I was uh, a little kid and all my brothers were home, I kind of saw it as my job, my mission to, to irritate them and to annoy them. And I was very, very good at that job. I really was. But when Joseph tells his brothers about these dreams and all this other stuff, what was sibling, sibling rivalry was now turning into murderous anger. And so one day the brothers are out tending sheep. They're far from home. You know, they're going where there's grass you know, for the sheep. And they were plotting against Joseph. The, all 11 of them, they were sitting there going, you know, he's really getting annoying. And Joseph was sent by Jacob to go check on them, and when he found his brothers, since they were out in an isolated area, they decided to put their idle planning to action. And so first their plan was to kill him. But then they decided to sell him to slave traders who took him to Egypt. And his brothers took that coat that they hated so much, and they smeared animal blood on it, and so they showed that to Jacob and told him that Joseph had been killed and, and by a wild animal. Now, thinking back to the relationship that I've had with my brothers over the years, I can tell you that I've had conflicts with my siblings, and there were times in our youth that we bickered and didn't get along so hot, but never, to my knowledge, did my older brothers ever try and plan to sell me, and never, to my knowledge, did I uh, catch wind that they were trying to kill me. Now, there were a few times that they chased me and said they were going to kill me, but I don't think they meant that. And my oldest brother used to tell me to go play on the freeway, which was sort of odd because at that time West Bend didn't have a freeway, but that's different. But imagine how Joseph Hurt, betrayed by his brothers, sold into slavery, sold like a cow, never to see his family again. Or so he thought. Well, I'm sure that we can relate to this. You know, we all suffer hurts. We've all been betrayed. We've all counted on someone's loyalties, which turned out to be a mistake. We've all had people break promises to us. We've all hurt when we figured out that people that we love have manipulated us. We hurt when confronted by unfaithfulness. We've all felt betrayed when we had to deal with lies and dishonesty. When Joseph was sold and made a slave, things really stunk for him at first. He found himself in the house of a guy named Potiphar, and that was going okay until Potiphar's wife made it clear to Joseph that she wanted to have an affair with him, and he refused. He said, how can I do such a sin against God? And so, you know, hell hath no fury like a woman scorned, and so she made up a story that, uh, that he had tried to rape her, and he was thrown in prison for her several years. But then things got better for Joseph. The Pharaoh had had some dreams he needed interpreted, and, and Joseph was known, how to, that it was known that he knew how to do that, and so he interpreted these dreams for Pharaoh that there was going to be seven good years followed by seven years of famine. And so the Pharaoh told Joseph to, to, to plan for that, to 
prepare the country for those seven years. And Joseph prospered in Egypt. He rose to power up to the top, just beneath Pharaoh himself. But he still had that hurt. He still had that anger. He still had that bitterness for his brothers who had tried so hard to get rid of him. Now I think you'll agree with me that when people do stuff to us that hurts us or makes us angry, or both, that there are some common strategies, some different things that we may do in response to when people do these things to us. And the first and the most obvious one is we get mad. We want revenge. We plot to get even, to get justice. And we carry inside of us a sense of fairness that demands that we settle the score. Fair is fair, right? Well, I assume you noticed in the gospel today that Jesus would disagree with that and that he'd disagree a lot. Now, I'm not going to do a sermon on the Old Testament lesson and on the gospel, but I will tell you that I know when I hear what Jesus said today that you probably agree with me that you know, there are a couple of things that Jesus says that you know, we don't want to hear. We like it when Jesus says, for God so loved the world. We like it that Jesus said, I will, I'm with you always to the end of the age. We like it when Jesus says, go and make disciples. That those things are fine, right? But then Jesus says, love your enemies, be good to those who hate you, pray for those who persecute you, and we hear that and we go, right? It's hard to do. Just like when Jesus said, be perfect as my Father in heaven is perfect. We hear that stuff and we go, don't know how I'm going to do that. But I need to remind you here this morning, when Jesus says those things, it's not a suggestion. It's uh, not him saying politely, well, you know, there is an alternative to how we normally do these things. This is an order. We are being told we have to do this. And we know that revenge doesn't work. Our first thought when people wrong us is to try and get revenge, but it doesn't work. It never does because it's never enough. If we get revenge on someone and hurt them back, then they're going to want to hurt us worse, and then we're going to want to hurt them back. And you know how that spiral goes. Now, another strategy that we sometimes employ is that we do what we can to make the hurt seem smaller. And so sometimes... We'll start making excuses for the person that has hurt us so that we will feel like we don't have to be as hurt as we are. We say things or think things to ourselves like, he isn't all that bad, she meant well, it's what he's going through, it's the current culture, things like that. And Joseph may have thought and remembered that Jacob, his dad, had grabbed the family fortune by tricking his twin brother Esau, and he may have thought that what his brothers did wasn't that bad after all, it wasn't all their fault, they're just taking after dad, right? And sometimes we make excuses for the person who hurt us. And when we do that, we then try and minimize the offense and therefore try and diminish and make smaller our pain. That doesn't really work. Or then there are times that we blame ourselves for the sins of others. Joseph may have thought, well, wouldn't I be mad if our father gave my brother a fancy coat and not to me? It must be my fault. I bragged. I was full of myself, I taunted them with my arrogance and boasted about my dreams. Because if you go back and look it up in, in Genesis, Joseph really was kind of a pain. <laughs> he, you know, he was bragging, he was an arrogant kid because it doesn't say this in Genesis, but I'm guessing he may have said at some point, Daddy likes me best, kind of a thing. You know? And so maybe we try and minimize the pain by taking the blame for ourselves, but that doesn't really work. And another thing that we try to do is we just try to ignore the pain or the hurt. We try to deny it. We try to smooth things over for the sake of peace. And I'm not saying that there's reconciliation there. We just say to ourselves, I'm just going to push this way down and, and try and ignore it. And when we do this, it only works for a little bit, right? Because you ever try that? And then you blow up at the person months or years later when the pain in here just keeps building up and building up and building up until it, you know, it throws up or come, throws out. And Joseph may have tried to do that too. kind of looks that way in Genesis 42. And we certainly do are guilty of that today. But the hurt and the hate and the grief still live on here if we don't actually have reconciliation, if we just try and ignore it. 
And there's a reason why these strategies don't work either, because self-deception is not forgiveness. So back in Genesis, we read that the famine in Canaan drove Joseph's brothers to Egypt to buy grain. As I said, the, the Pharaoh had had a dream that there were going to be seven really good years and then seven really bad years. And so they had stored grain in Egypt to prepare for the famine. And so in the second year of the famine, uh, Jacob and his family had run out of food and they were sent to Egypt to go buy grain. And so they stood before this guy. They did not recognize this guy who literally held their life in their hands. And it, it's Joseph. But they don't recognize Joseph. They haven't seen him for roughly 20 years so he's gotten older. He's dressed like an Egyptian. I would guess probably that he walked like an Egyptian. Sorry. But when they have this first meeting, Joseph seems to be think thinking to himself, you know, let them tremble a bit. In fact, no, let them tremble a lot. It's payback time. And he looks at them and he says, you guys are liars, you're spies, you're here to, to do evil in our country. But revenge didn't work. It never does. It didn't make Joseph feel better. And remember what God said about revenge. He said, revenge is mine, not yours. And every time Joseph thought about vengeance on, him, on his brothers, he himself was the one who was hurt by that. But as time goes on here in the book of Genesis, as events continue to happen, the miracle of forgiveness is starting to take place. He was letting go. Joseph faced the fact that his brothers had done him terrible wrongs. And real forgiveness faces that hurt. Real forgiveness brings reconciliation. And so you can say things like, you caused me more pain than can be measured. And no, no excuses, no tolerating, no rationalizing, no denying, no ignoring. You've got to bring the truth to the surface, out front, up front. For example, overdrinkers ruin their livers. Criminal, criminals serve time in jail. Your forgiveness does not erase the police record. Your forgiveness does not rejuvenate you know, that person's liver, but that forgiveness does heal. And so by the time we get to our text, Joseph looked in his brother's eyes and said, I'm Joseph. I'm your brother. Is my father still alive? I thought it's weird he didn't say is our, is our father, but... And then he hugs Benjamin. And of course, he had a special relationship with Benjamin because those were the two children of, you know, Jacob's favorite wife. So they were closer. And so he hugged Benjamin and all his brothers, and they all cried. And this crescendo of forgiveness, it had been building for years. And here it happens in one amazing moment. For others... Forgiveness may come slowly in bits and pieces, but once forgiveness comes to take over our lives, we start to live a new life, a better life. We're reborn. When forgiveness is born, both offender and offended receive new life and healing. It's a miracle when forgiveness takes place. It's something bigger and better than what's human and what's natural. Because here's the thing that you really need to remember here this morning. Don't expect to discover this ability to forgive in your talents, in your repertoire. It's like the, the beginning of, of Genesis when God created something out of nothing. Forgiveness comes only from God, only through His Son, Jesus Christ, crucified and risen for you. It only comes from the Holy Spirit working in here. Because only because we are forgiven by God through faith in Jesus can we begin to forgive each other truly, freely, and completely. It is the Holy Spirit that makes forgiveness of others happen in here. A guy named Louis Smedes wrote a book called Forgive and Forget, and there's a quote here I want to share with you. He says, When we forgive, we come as close as any human can to the essentially divine act of creation, for we create a new beginning out of the past pain. Because again, it's the Holy Spirit. It's God's gifts that enable us to do that. So let me give you an example from history. 
or somebody was able to overcome the, the hurt that someone inflicted on him and demonstrate forgiveness. In our recent time in my conversations with some of you, we have noted that you know, the political climate in this country is continuing to go downhill and, and politics has, des has descended into a barrage of name calling and insults and rudeness. And if you don't know this, politics has always been a dirty business in, in this country. Uh, but I think we would agree that in the past few years it is much worse now. But if we go back uh, about 150 years to Abraham Lincoln, we are told that Abe Lincoln had an early political rival by the name of Edwin Stanton. And they had worked on a legal case together, and after that case was over, uh, Stanton said of Lincoln, after treating him, treating him rudely in this case they worked on together, his quote about Lincoln was that Lincoln was a long, lank creature from Illinois wearing a dirty linen duster for a coat on the back of which the perspiration had splotched wide stains that resembled a map of the continent. Pretty rude thing to say. He's basically saying that Abe was ugly, he had bad tastes in clothes, and he had sweat issues. Well, after Abe Lincoln was elected president, he needed to select someone to be in his cabinet as the Secretary of War. And he asked his advisors who would be the best guy for this job, and he was told, Edwin Stanton. And he picked him and put him on his cabinet because he'd forgiven him for the rude things that he had said and done. And after Abraham Lincoln had died at the funeral for President Lincoln, Edwin Stanton addressed the people at this funeral, and he said, There lies the most perfect ruler of men the world has ever seen. Because President Lincoln had learned to forgive. So to wrap up here this morning, it is God that enables us to rise above the injuries we receive at the hands of others. It is God that enables us to forgive. Because Jesus died and rose again, we are forgiven today, every day. And because of our blessings from God, because of the forgiveness and love that we have from above, we can love and we can forgive. So it is my prayer here this morning that God would bless us, that God would inspire us, and lead us to do just that. In the name of Jesus, amen. And the peace of God which surpasses all human understanding may keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus unto life everlasting. Amen. We now stand for the prayers and petitions of our congregation. O Lord, your servant Joseph endured hardship and struggle, yet believed it would come to good. Give us such tested faith and bring all things to completion according to your purposes in Jesus, who has brought hope to the world. Lord, in your mercy, lead all pastors, missionaries, and church workers in faithful service to your people with compassion and love. Bless every place where we hear your word and serve our neighbor in Christ's name. Lord, in your mercy. Let your love have its way with us, Lord. Lead us to love our enemies and serve those in need. Put an end to all bitterness and strife. Let forgiveness reign between each of us as Jesus' blood covers our sins before your heavenly throne. Lord, in your mercy. Uphold civil authority and those responsible to you for the welfare of our nation, state, and community. Help them to pursue the cause of justice and protect life from beginning to natural end. We ask you to bring peace and unity in our country. We ask you to bring peace around the world, especially as we think of the border between Ukraine and Russia. Guard all first responders and protect those who defend us here or abroad, including Thomas, Chris, Preston, and Evan, Cannon, Teresa, David, and Maya, Grant, Chris, David, and John, Ben, Debbie, Seth, and Vanessa, Kendon, Christian, and Matthew. Lord, in your mercy. Comfort all who suffer 
Deliver the sick according to your will, and sustain by your grace those troubled in body or soul. Especially we lift up in prayer those printed in our bulletin insert here this morning, and for those that we pray silently in our hearts that uh, God would, be, that you, Jesus, would be with them, bless them, and heal them. Give your comfort to those who grieve. Grant your children patience. Grant your children courage to endure every time of trial with hope in Christ. Lord, in your mercy. We give thanks for the gift of this blessed sacrament, O Lord. Give us a right heart as we prepare to eat and drink Christ's true body and blood, that by it we would be equipped to love you above all and our neighbors as ourselves. Lord, in your mercy. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of all creation, for you've had mercy on us and given your only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. In your righteous judgment, you condemned the sin of Adam and Eve, who ate the forbidden fruit, and you justly barred them and all their children from the tree of life. Yet in your great mercy, you promised salvation by a second Adam, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and made his cross a life-giving tree for all who trust in him. We give you thanks for the redemption you have prepared for us through Jesus Christ. Grant us your Holy Spirit, that we may faithfully eat and drink of the fruits of his cross and receive the blessings of forgiveness, life, and salvation that come to us in his body and blood. Hear us as we pray in his name and as he has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, this cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do, as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. You now may be seated for our distribution.
body of our Lord and Savior Jesus given on the cross for you. We stand for prayer. We pray. Gracious God, our Heavenly Father, you've given us a foretaste of the feast to come in the Holy Supper of your Son's body and blood. Keep us firm in the true faith throughout our days of pilgrimage, that on the day of his coming we may, together with all your saints, celebrate the marriage feast of the Lamb in his kingdom, which has no end. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. You may be seated for our closing song, where we will say that again.
And all God's people said, Okay, I realize that's not the peppiest song we end with. Let's do that again. All God's people said, Amen. All right, that's a little better. God be with you and bless you this day and this week.